Hi, Adam here. Another quick warning, this podcast contains adult themes, strong language, and descriptions of extreme violence. Gone Fishing, Part 6. The Man with the Black Eyes. No pupils. They're black. When you look at him, that was my abiding impression of him. His eyes were black. Yes, I would think as a teenager, a very good-looking lad and all that sort of thing. He just went on the dark side. Roger Chambers has been a crime barrister since the 1960s, so now nothing much surprises him. He knows what's just beneath the skin of respectable society. Back when he started in the law, drinking in pubs past 6pm was still a crime. As a result, illicit pubs, sly grog dens they were called, flourished. They sprang up in Auckland's city fringe suburbs, places like Ponsonby and Grey Lynn. Nowadays, these suburbs are all multi-million dollar bungalows and cafes, but back then, this was the rough end of town. Chambers says it was a time when there was still honour among thieves and mindless violence wasn't the norm, not like today. One of Chambers' first bosses told him you don't learn law from the book, so he dragged him round to some of those drinking dens and the nearby brothels. And there, Chambers would knock about with colourful underworld characters, people like Too Fat Smith. He also encountered a wider world of fascinating folk, thieves and gang leaders, poets, writers, drunks. So these were the people Roger Chambers would throw back a pint with, or defend when they stood in the dock. So yeah, nothing much surprises Roger Chambers. But even he was taken aback when he took on the job of representing Stephen Stone at the High Court. Sure, the crimes Stone was accused of were appalling, but the real surprise came when Chambers asked his client to tell him his side of the story. Stuff and RNZ, this is Gone Fishing, a podcast by Amy Maas and me, Adam Dudding. For a time, Roger Chambers was the go-to lawyer for one of New Zealand's most notorious gangs. I was, for about 10, 15 years, national counsel for the mongrel mob. I'd travel the countryside looking after these beggars. I always got on very well with them, but what they did was appalling. There's a large part of the New Zealand society that does get involved in surprising things. <laughs> People in large part are moulded by their upbringing most of the time, but there's also a lot of people who are born bad who will make a conscious choice because we have in New Zealand and in Australia some serious criminals that had the most fortunate of upbringings. Stephen Stone, the choice to be bad was his. Mid-1998. Stephen Stone has been charged with two murders and a rape and is preparing for a trial at the High Court in Auckland. He's 28 years old. He is a member of the Black Power Gang, In a probation report, he describes himself as a bit of a rebel. But there's a bit more to it than that. He already has a long criminal record. His first conviction was in 1984, around the time he left school, and he's run up a total of 48 since then. There's minor stuff, cannabis possession, driving without a license, breaches of periodic detention. But there's also car theft, burglary, dangerous driving, and possession of an offensive weapon. In all, he's committed 10 violent offences. In fact, he spent much of the 1990s in prison. In 1992, he was involved in an aggravated robbery at a Kumiu winery and was sentenced to almost six years in prison. He was reportedly arrested at a hospital two days after his second child was born. Five years later, soon after being released from prison, he was speeding down a rural road and crossed the centre line. He crashed head-on into a car driven by an elderly woman. That crash was in May 1997. He was arrested for Dean Fulisane's murder in July the same year. The charges for Leah Stevens' rape and murder were added in April 1998. By June 1998, he's on bail and his legal aid file lands on the desk of Roger Chambers. Stone was easy to get on with, but a born thug. And as I say, and he may not thank me for this, I got the impression that he rather enjoyed the notoriety of it all because it meant a couple of serious notches in his belt. 20 years on, Chambers is still in the same office in Vulcan Lane in the middle of Auckland City. The office probably looks much the same now as it did then. 
Even with the windows closed, we can hear sirens and cars and the general hum of the city. From his third floor window, Chambers can see if any of his staff are in his favourite pub before going to join them. In 1998, when Chambers receives the police files about Dean Fuller Sands and Leah Stevens, he finds them hard to fault. This investigation looks complex, but well handled. So, the police found no forensic evidence well, the crimes are almost a decade old and Larnock Road has been completely refurbished. Of course they won't find any DNA. The lack of a body, in Dean's case? Well, it's out there somewhere, Chambers reckons. Keep in mind, this is the guy whose job is to convince a jury that Stone isn't guilty. But Chambers is remarkably candid about the fact that he never believed Stone was innocent. If he's proclaiming his innocence now, that does come as a surprise. He's entitled to hold the view, but I don't believe him. (laughs) But perhaps it's not all that surprising that Chambers doesn't buy Stephen Stone's version of events, because, basically, Stone didn't seem to have one back when Chambers was his lawyer. I didn't get very much in the way of instructions from him, and I well remember when I did press him on trying to get him to tell his side of the story, his comment was, it's all fucking shit. Do what you want to do. Stone shows even less interest once the trial begins. He was a breeze to represent because he wasn't one of those fellows that's forever dragging on your gown and handing you in myriad of notes about this, that and the other. He just sat there. He just sat there. Stone is quiet in court and menacing. He's covered in tattoos. He wears his black power leathers. One reporter writes that he seems determined to appear staunch. Mark Franklin agrees. All I can recall about Stone is that he sat there as cold as stone and didn't show any emotion. As lead detective, though, Franklin isn't judging Stone by the look on his face or the way he sits. Stone's interviews are conducted by Franklin's team, so he's not even spent a lot of time up close with Stone. He says his opinion is based simply on the facts and what the witnesses say. He was charismatic and definitely a leader, but unfortunately his leadership qualities went towards crime. Um, and violent crime, drugs, prostitution. Uh, he had influence over the prostitutes or the, the woman that he was staying with in, in Larnock Road. And he obviously had influence to cover up what he'd done. I mean, to shoot somebody in a garage with, you know, six, seven, eight other people, I can't recall how many there was, and then order them to get involved and do what he did. And then, of course, with Leah, word coming out that she was going to go to the police, and that's the reason she was taken out. The prosecutor called it a cold-blooded killer, and that's what it is. I mean, sure, he was only young, but um, even at a young age, you can't go around killing people. In the last couple of episodes, we dug into the transcripts of Neil and Martin's many versions of Dean's and Leah's deaths. And something I found really striking is how they describe themselves as having almost no free will when it comes to Stone. Stone tells them to shoot Dean's body. Stone orders them to bury Dean. Stone tells them to get in the car. Stone tells them to rape Leah. They never protest. They never try to stop him. They never tell on him until the police track them down nearly a decade later. When detectives ask them about this, both men always say the same thing. They were terrified of Stone. Martin says he never even got a cut from the numerous burglaries he did with Stone. At best, Stone might buy him a burger. He says one time, Stone repeatedly shot him in the leg with a slug pistol as a joke. He says Stone wasn't a friend. Rather, Martin was stupid enough to do something for him once, and quote, then I couldn't really get away from him. Both he and Neil say that after the murders, their terror of Stone only grew. Martin says three years later, he was working at a car wash centre on the North Shore when Stone drove in. Martin was so scared, he ran and hid it in a storeroom. Which is pretty similar to what we already know about Neil that day at the New Lynn Periodic Detention Centre. The reason Neil contacts police to tell them more about Leah is because he's just bumped into Stone and fled through a back entrance. Of course, we don't have to trust anything that Neil or Martin say. They are proven liars. Also, if you're trying to minimise your involvement in a series of crimes, it's probably not a bad idea to pretend that fear turned you into some sort of slave. Yet Neil and Martin weren't the only ones who found Stone scary. After the trial, journalist Tony Wall co-wrote a background article about him. 
Tony interviewed relatives and former partners and others who knew Stone. One former friend said he found Stone extremely intimidating and that, quote, his eyes would just pierce through you. Others told Tony that Stone would often talk about giving people the bash if they crossed him. Stephen Stone still stands out as one of the worst of the killers that I've covered over the years, just in terms of his pure cold-bloodedness. And he was only 19 when he did this. Um, Killed two people within a short space of time. And as Mark Franklin said, um, killing someone and then eliminating a witness, that's as bad as it gets. He killed in cold blood, not once, but twice. And he got away with it for nearly 10 years. Stephen Stone was finally brought to justice on Friday when a jury found him... During and after the trial, Stone is something of a media sensation. New Zealand doesn't see a lot of double murders. We're not used to hearing about a case where a witness is killed so she won't talk. Passing around a gun to implicate the bystanders? Unheard of. So punning headlines using Stone's name are too tempting to ignore. Their story is a chilling insight into a stone-cold killer. These crimes seem so alien. It's almost like New Zealand media don't have the language for it, so they have to borrow from the hard-bitten vocabulary of gangland America. Because Dean's death is allegedly at Gail Maney's request, it gets called a contract killing, or an execution-style contract killing, or a gruesome execution-style slaying. The events occurred in that special place called the criminal underworld, and Dean isn't so much shot as pumped with bullets. His death is a hit. Stone is a hitman. It's not that any of these phrases are inaccurate, exactly. It's just that if you look at the finer details of what's meant to have happened, the tough guy language just seems a bit off. This isn't the godfather. Sure, there's random violence, but there's also stupidity and chaos and ineptitude. All that nonsense Neil makes up about hitting Steve number two over the head with a shovel. All those journeys to Fotipu and back again, twice after someone realises there are fingerprints all over Dean's burnt orange Hillman Avenger. So Hitman? Execution-style slaying? These seem inappropriately glamorous ways of describing what the record actually shows, which is that this is a shambolic collection of violent, drug-addled, young idiots, kids with poor impulse control and a world view that doesn't stretch much further than the next wild party. They commit some disgusting, pointless crimes because they don't know how to use their time in a better way and because their antisocial behaviour is endorsed by a wider community of people like them. But not everyone sees Stone as a bad guy, let alone a stone-cold killer. When Gail Maney and Tanya Wilson met Stone in 1989, Gail thought he was kind of hot. We thought he was cute and sexy and we took him home for a threesome, which ended up being all over the news. <laughs> Stone was a bouncer at the K Road parlours where Gail Maney started to work in late 1989. She knew he was a burglar because he stored stolen goods at her house in Larnock Road. He also drove tow trucks. Sure, some men found him a little bit intimidating, but... Stephen was, well, quite charismatic towards women, you know, like charming, and he'd always want to kind of look after women and make sure that they were OK. But he also tried to do things to impress you. So I think he used to big note about things or exaggerate about stuff because he wants, you know, he's the man. He wants to be cool and um, wants everybody to like him and wants his life to be kind of exciting so that you look up to him. So I think that he used to exaggerate things, you know, stories and that. But he also been involved in martial arts. I think it was called Sudor. So he used to like to show off you know, like impress the woman or whoever around him that he's tough and show all his moves. So he would get people like my brother and do his move, you know, like his stuff on him and make him come and say, come on, learn to be a man and, you know, like punch him and things like that. Or he'd sometimes wrestle us girls and put us into like holds and things like that, but not in a way where he was hurting us. It was kind of a little bit of fun. Gail's opinion of the Stephen Stone she knew in 1989 doesn't change much over the years. Not long after the guilty verdict, Gail's behind bars and still trying to figure out in her own mind whether Stone could be guilty of something. Here's what she writes about him in one of her prison diaries. Rape and murder doesn't fit the guy I knew in 1989 who was charming and so nice to women. He liked women. Steve cried a lot the short time I knew him over his mother as he was cut up. All the women would comfort him because I think his mother had cancer. 
Um, it was genuine hurt. Nothing gets to a woman more than a man cut up and crying. <laughs> Since 1992, Stephen Stone has spent almost all of his time in prison. In theory, he's been eligible for parole since 2008, but at every parole board hearing so far, he's missed out. His next hearing will be in late 2019. In there, behind bars, he's alone. But out in the world, where time doesn't stop, he has a family. He has two sons and a daughter, and six grandchildren. He writes to them and calls them from prison. His father has moved cities to be closer to the prison where Stone's being held. Also, Stone has a wife waiting for him. I've just always had a soft spot for Stephen. I've always cared about him. Yeah, and it developed into being in love. In 2015, they married behind bars. It was a second marriage. Stone's wife doesn't believe he's a murderer or a rapist. That doesn't match the character of the man she's known ever since they became friends in the 1980s. And though they've never been able to live together, she's turned her house into a home for the both of them. I've got his clothes all in the bedroom. Um, I've got his artwork up, his carvings, his shoes are sitting in the wardrobe. Stephen's pictures, our photos, all around the house. We wanted to know if Stone really is as menacing and evil as the headlines and the police will have you believe. So we met his wife at the place she calls their home. We won't tell you where it is and we don't want to name her, but we will say that this woman is totally devoted. I don't believe he murdered anyone. Um, Maybe I'm naive, I don't know, but I've always seen the good side in Stephen. I've seen the gentle, caring person that he can be. They're on the phone to each other every day. They always sign off with, I love you. Stone also writes letters to his wife. She has a box of them, page after page of refill paper totally covered in Stone's tidy handwriting, which is all in capital letters. He writes a lot about wanting to be with her and about the oppressive feeling of being locked up with little hope for release. She reads to us from one of them. Yes, a long time I've been locked up for. From August 92 through to January 97, I was out for six months before I was set up, framed, fucked over for the bullshit that makes my skin crawl, my blood boils full on. I won't rave on too much about what I've crawled through and struggled with, but all of everything that meant anything in my life was completely full-on, hardcore, turned upside down, pulled inside out, smashed into bits, twisted, wrung out, and then slowly torn apart and broken into bits. Not everything Stone writes is quite that dark. There's a poem he sends his wife that she's keen to read for us. I wish that I was free today so I could go out and play. What would I do? What would I choose? I'd ride my bike and spend time with my kids. I would kiss your lips, swim in the sea, walk on the grass. These are some of the things I really miss. To open a door by myself, watching my loved ones grow. These things I yearn for to no avail. I must stay here, this I know, until the control freaks let me go. When I get out, I'll be good, just like my mama said I should. <laughs> It's groovy, eh? <laughs> uh. Stone's wife has become close to her new father-in-law, Gary Stone. Hi, you must be Gary. Yeah. Adams. <laughs> Hi there. Coffee? Come Why not? We Why met him at her house. Gary moved town to be closer to the prison in Whanganui where his son is held. I go to visit him quite regularly. In his own words, he'll just say, I do what I have to do. Stephen just gets on with his time in prison. He does a lot of carving, which he is good at, and he just keeps fit. But he's just got an attitude that he just can't be bothered listening to corrections. Despite asking for more than a year, Amy and I didn't get permission from corrections to interview Stephen Stone directly. But we figured Gary was better placed than anyone to give us an idea of Stone's thoughts about the case that got him jailed for life, and about the guilt or innocence of Gail Maney. According to Gary, his son simply says he's innocent of the two murders and a rape that put him behind bars. It's the story Stone's been telling for the past 20 years. Well, 
Apart from a brief glitch eight years ago, we will come back to this in more detail later, but in 2010, Stone actually confessed to the two murders. He now says he did that purely because other lifers told him it would improve his odds of getting parole. He didn't get parole, and he returned quite quickly to his original position, which is that he's innocent. Yeah, just like Gail, Stephen Stone says he didn't even know his supposed first victim. Stephen said to me he's got no recollection of Dean Fuller Sandys at all. You know, we're only really presuming the guy is dead. There is no body to be found, so I don't know. You've got to presume he's dead because his family at that time, 20 years ago, had never seen him in 10 years. Stone always denied knowing Dean Fullisan, starting from the day in 1997 when he was arrested for his murder. He told police he had no idea who this guy was. He'd seen his picture on the Crime Watch TV appeal the other day, but hadn't recognised him. But rather than focusing on giving police reasons to believe those denials, Stone treated this interview like some sort of game. The interviewing officer asked if he knew anyone by the name of Dean. Stone said, only Dean Bell, who I knew at Birkdale Primary. And later he added, I've just remembered two other Deans, Dean Cannon and Dean Atchison. He's deliberately wasting their time. Anyway, over the years, Stone has also talked to his father about the other murder he's accused of, that of Leah Stevens. Stephen knew Leah Stevens from the nightclub work that they were probably both involved with, but Stephen had said he had nothing to do with her death at that time. Not only that... Stephen said he never raped Leah Stevens, and he had no reason to rape a woman. They always were flocking after him anyhow. In the police case, it was like Stephen says, if we can't get him on a murder charge, we'll get him on a rape charge. So why did Stone make so little effort to defend himself at the time of his arrest? An innocent person who's wrongly accused will usually move heaven and earth to convince the police that they've got it wrong. But instead, Stone was being either flippant or staunch during his interviews. He challenged the cops to go hard and made jokes about all the deans he had ever known. If you're innocent and facing two murder charges, that seems pretty reckless or stupid. Stephen's attitude is like he doesn't conform to anything, so... By not conforming to anything, he's not going to help the police himself or anybody else. It was much the same at the trial, when Stone made no effort to help his lawyer Roger Chambers put together a defence. I think Stephen's attitude was like he had nothing to do with any of it, and he just went to court and thought that he would get off the charges. He didn't expect to get a prison term out of it. Stephen says the police set him up. Stephen was always in and out of trouble with the police and I think they decided that Stephen Stone should be put away and out of their hair for as long as they could possibly get him out of it. And when Gail Maney's fate became tied to Stephen Stone's, that wasn't good for Gail. Stone hasn't really talked to his father about Gail's case, but if Stone were innocent, that would pretty much guarantee Gail was innocent too. It's hard to be guilty of commissioning a hit if the hitman didn't do it. Stone put it this way at the time of Gail's second trial in 2000. He said to me, Dad, they're not going to let her get off because if they let her get off, they've got to look into my case again. Stone has a theory about why the police were gunning for him. Stephen believes that Detective Franklin, was his surname, had a beef with him because of an armed robbery that he'd done previously at Kumu. And the guy that he robbed, apparently, this is coming from Stephen himself, committed suicide a year later. And Stephen told me that that is why Detective Franklin was really out to get him. When all the story came out, that was Detective Franklin's opportunity to put him away for life. News reports about that armed robbery say Stone and an accomplice broke into Oldfields Winery in Kumu, West Auckland, in August 1992. They say that the manager of the winery was struck on the head with an iron bar, and Stone and his accomplice then took thousands of dollars from the safe. 
Before leaving, they tied the man and his wife up. Reportedly, the man later committed suicide. So one aspect of Stone's theory seems to match reality. But we asked Mark Franklin about this theory, that this suicide inspired the police to pin some cold case deaths on Stone. And Franklin flatly denied it. He said he only learned about Stone's existence once the case began. I had no personal grievance against Stephen Stone. I'd never met him before in my life. Um, his name had only came up when Tanya gave me his name. In any case, after serving his time for that Kumiu robbery, Stephen Stone was out of prison just six months before being arrested again and charged with Dean's murder. It was during that six-month period that his car crossed the centre line on a road in Derry Flat and hit another car head-on. Stone received several broken bones, including a fractured pelvis, but the woman in the other car, 70-year-old Hazel Bennett, was killed. It was just a terrible accident, says Gary. I knew of the, the road accident because he got periodic detention from that. Um, maybe he went to sleep at the wheel, I'm not sure. He definitely didn't drive across the centre of the line thinking I'll kill somebody. <laughs> Gary Stone is 69. Before he retired, he was a mechanic. He's become very knowledgeable about the arguments in support of his son's innocence. He knows about the torch that was found during the search for Dean at Fatipu. He knows about the documents which show that Catherine Sal's house wasn't fully built when she was meant to be witnessing a burglary at Gales. But he's not trying to minimise the fact that at the time of Stone's arrest, his son was already a serious criminal. Gary should know. After all, he was there as Stephen took his first steps towards a life of crime. And despite serious efforts on the part of Gary and his wife Margaret, they felt unable to stop him. Gary says Stephen is the only person in the wider family who's been in trouble with the law. They had two sons, but while the younger one thought the path to success was hard work, Stephen thought it was... Better to do things illegally. That was an easier way to get stuff. He is wired up totally different to me. And any psychologist will tell you that. They are wired up totally different. There's nothing you're going to do to change it. There's something, though, that Gary wants to clarify. He's not exactly Stephen's father. Well, at the time we got married, my wife was pregnant. So naturally I thought it was mine. But when he worked out the time frame, it was only like about seven months. So we just got on with it. And she admitted to me that she had a relationship with somebody else. But we just left that behind. But my parents would never really accept him as a grandchild because of that. Perhaps that rejection made Stephen's life a little harder. But the central problem Gary and Margaret faced when raising Stephen was that he simply had too much energy. You know, I tried to correct him as a father. He was always, what we'd say, hypo. Myself and his mother, we took him to the doctors on a couple of occasions and tried to explain the situation, but nobody had an answer to it. Now it's called ADHD. And because of that energy, it, it just seemed to have got him into trouble. Stephen was born in 1969. His younger brother was born in 1971. Gary and Margaret both worked. They were a normal family. But Stephen was always... Too active, like he would shake his cot to pieces until it fell over so he could get out and one time wandered down the street. Some lady asked me and his mother if she could take him to church one time. This was when he was about five, but he was so disruptive in the class she didn't want him back there. <laughs> his offending didn't really start until maybe 13 or 14. That's when the trouble with school began too. I'd been fined for not sending him to school. Well, we sent him to school, but he didn't go there. And so I just said to the headmaster, I said, look, I'll save us a lot of drama, I'll just take him out of school and I'll give him work. And they agreed to that. 
And so did the education board. That was when I employed him to teach him to be a mechanic, which I paid him for. He was quite interested in cars, but yeah, I think he found it too time-consuming because of his ADHD problem. Something that took an hour to fix wasn't really him. Like, I haven't got the patience for that. Gary knew his teenage son was misbehaving. There was petty crime, some burglaries. He tried to pull Stephen into line. When he was working for me in the workshop, I bought Stephen a car so that he could get his licence, which he did, but he didn't want the car because it was like a Triumph Herald friggin' station wagon and it wasn't cool. So I sold the car and gave him the money. The person I sold the car to, he came in to get some repairs done on it. And in Stephen's mind, basically, oh, that's my car. And he took it out of the garage and decided to go for a run in it. I guess he thought he could just do whatever he felt like doing. Well, because I called him out, uh, we had a bit of an argument about it, but then... Pretty much I gave him a dong in front of his friends and said, you know, that's theft, that the car doesn't belong to you anymore. I gave him a sideswipe backhander across the chin, I guess, yeah. I wasn't really a physical person with my kids, and sometimes I think I should have kicked them up the ass more than I did, but my mother was my stepmother, and she was... Not a very nice person, if I want to put it that way. And I didn't really want to bring that on my own kids. At 16, Stephen left home. He got a girlfriend. They had a son together, but the relationship was on and off. He pumped petrol at a service station for a while. In 1989, the year he's meant to have killed Dean and Leah, Stone was just 19. And Gary actually saw a lot of his son that year, because Margaret was very ill, and Stephen would visit them in Epsom in the months before she died. But when Stephen wasn't visiting them... I really don't know what he was getting involved in. Um, I knew he worked in nightclubs, but I didn't particularly know he worked at Chaplin's. I, I wouldn't even know where Chaplin's was. After that, Stone's known offending grew more serious. The aggravated robbery that put him in jail was three years later. So in 1998, when Gary learned his son had been arrested again, this time for murder, he didn't know what to think. Somebody's charged him with murder, so it's like, well, he wouldn't charge somebody for no reason at all, would you, you know? He said he never did it, um, but that's besides the point. You have to just go on the evidence that's put in front of you. And over time, Gary decided that evidence probably wasn't good enough. To my way of thinking, there was no DNA in that house from either of those murders. There was no forensics in that house from either of those murders. I didn't hear anybody come forward and say, I cleaned up the mess. Who cleaned up all the blood? I can't say if he's guilty or not guilty, but... If I was on a jury, you can only go on the evidence that's put in front of you and, like, hardcore evidence, not what somebody says. People supposedly living in a house next door said, yeah, we've seen everything. And when they went through the building contract records, the house was a skeleton at the time. But according to them, they were living in it. So what do you believe, you know? Whatever Gary may believe about this case, or his son's past in general... I guess you don't give up on your kids, doesn't matter what they've done, you know. Gary's younger son left New Zealand around the time Margaret died. After that... Stephen was really the only family I had left, other than my parents. When he was charged with Dean Fuller Sandy's murder... He spent time in Pararimo, Remo, and I used to go down probably once a month, once every two months to see him. Yeah, his brother had gone to Australia, his mother had died, and he was the only one left in the family. So, yeah, I've had a bit of a lonely life for the last 30 years, really.
Stone says he's innocent. His father thinks the same. So does his wife. Me, I'm not sure what to think about Stone's insistence that he didn't commit those murders. Stone is clearly a far less sympathetic figure than Gail. That history of serious violent crime surely counts heavily against him. But obviously, if there are problems with the case against Gail Maney, then some of those problems transfer directly across to the case against Stone. Let me just turn off my phone. I don't want to. I don't want to be that guy. But there is one other person we talk to, one who's not directly related or married to Stone, who also thinks he really is innocent. When I first met Steve, it was in an interview room in Unit Nine. Chris Chevalier is a New Yorker, but now he's also a Kiwi. He met Stone when he was working for a Christian group, Prison Fellowship New Zealand. And it's quite a small room with a small desk and just two chairs opposite each side of the desk. And he was wearing his uh, prison fatigues, just a basic cotton tracksuit. And as soon as he walked in, big, white, bald head with nothing but a smile on his face, very firm, solid, well-mannered handshake, and was... Chris has spent many hours with Stone. He's got to know him really well. He has plenty to say about Stone's character and demeanour. There's a carving by Stone on his wall at home. Didn't come across as stone-cold killer and all the other stuff that you had heard. It was a small room and I, I just felt safe and I felt at ease and I felt that he was genuine. But Chris also has a rather strange story to tell, which explains why he thinks Stone is innocent. I'm no Columbo or detective, but I felt responsible to continue being part of something that I I guess wound up, and now I need to unwind this properly. They met around 2010. Stone had just started saying he was guilty after all. He went along to the Prison Fellowship's Sycamore program, eight or nine sessions inside the prison, and talked about his crimes. Chris was impressed. I worked with Steve, and I also worked with a couple of other guys that were in for life for murder, and I found Steve to be very easy and amicable and soft and gentle, even though he had quite a lot of muscle and quite a lot of ink, and he could screw up his face if he disagreed with something. At the end of each course, the fellowship offers to help offenders make contact with their victims or their victims' families. There's the possibility of a face-to-face meeting. Stone says he's keen, and Chris considers Stone a good candidate who's really taking responsibility for his crimes. So he gets the wheels rolling. Chris talks to Dean Flissan's mother, Carol, and his brother, Wayne, and they're interested but very cautious. Finally, they agree. They hope this might be their chance to finally find out where Dean is buried. They all meet in prison. Chairs have been set up in a circle. Stone and the Flissan's family sit across from each other. Chris is there too, and another person takes notes. Stone opens the meeting. He discussed how sorry he was, a little bit, but basically told them the story of what went down. And then they were able to ask questions. And so he walked through what was going on at the time and what he had done. Chris catches up with Dean's mother and brother after that, and they tell him something seemed wrong during that meeting with Stone. For a start, Stone hadn't been able to tell them where Dean was buried. Also, he seemed insincere. There was no remorse. And there was one other thing. Chris says during the meeting, Stone had discussed the mechanics of the moment that he actually drew his gun and shot Dean. I still believe that the brother thinks that Steve did it. But what Steve said was that the reason that he drew his weapon and shot Dean was that Dean drew first. But what Dean pulled out was a fish donger. And a fish donger is something that when you go fishing and you catch a fish, you can thump it on the head and knock it out. And that's the bit of shiny thing that Steve says that he saw. And the brother said that my brother didn't own a fish donger. Chris is unsettled by this and sets up another visit to Stone in private. He has a feeling he knows what's going on. All of a sudden, the light pings on you. I just looked at him and sat him down. I said, you lied. You didn't kill anybody. You haven't done anything. You weren't there. This doesn't stack up. Stone tells Chris he'd only confess because the other lifers told him it would improve his parole chances. 
my take from that point in time when I walked in the room and saw his face and then heard what he said and he like had no time to think of an explanation gave me that explanation I believe that he hasn't done it and that I believe that Steve is guilty of being stupid and making a really poor choice from that moment on Chris is not only convinced of Stone's innocence he takes an interest in Gail's story too when I met with Steve and told him he was a liar you know here's the co-offender so you're telling me that this person is in jail because of you and serving life on something that didn't happen. He says, yeah, but if you go over the case, we've said it all along, and she professed her innocence. And so I made contact with uh, Weary Prison and was able to get in and saw her. And before I met her, I called her on the phone and I said, this is who I am. I want to meet with you. And she went straight into rabbit talking mode of blah, 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 you know, and just laid out everything that had gone on, and she almost gave me the whole daily chronological events of everything that she'd been through. And I said, uh, I believe you. And she cried for the next three hours until I got there. And even now I get teary-eyed thinking she just went stone-cold silent on the phone like she couldn't believe what I had said. And I said, I believe you. I totally believe you, Gail. Next time on Gone Fishing. You've got the jury who, you know, they're just Joe Bloggs from society and they don't know anything about law or whatever and they fall asleep during the trial and it's important stuff and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, this is my life and these people are falling asleep. On the day that Gail finally got sentenced, we still had to go to Lollipop's land with a little boy who was looking forward to his birthday but really wanted his mum for his birthday. The jury came back with a verdict and she called out, we didn't mean to. Now, I heard it, the Crown Prosecutor heard it, and other people in the court. Gone Fishing is a joint production from Stuff and RNZ, written, presented and produced by Amy Maas and me, Adam Dudding. Our executive producers are Tim Watkin and Justin Gregory for RNZ, and Catherine Goldsworthy for Stuff. This episode was engineered by Rangi Poet, visuals by Jason Dorday. You can subscribe to the full eight-part series at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and other podcast providers. You can also go to the Stuff or RNZ homepages to listen or to find details on how to subscribe. <laughs>